Good evening. I've got things going off on my computer. So anyway, I wanted to go back for just a second to the schedule as I gave it to you. Uh, tonight, we're only going to do um, Hinduism. I, I know that we expected Dr. Akai uh, to come and do uh, indigenous religions of Africa, but he could not come because of COVID. And none of us are meeting, so therefore he was not able to come and do that particular lecture. Maybe uh, sometime I could get him to put it on video and send it to you. But tonight we're only going to do Hinduism. And next week, next uh, week we will do we will have an examination on the introduction on North American religions and Hinduism. Okay, I will send that to you via probably email. Uh, it will be your first exam, again, on the introduction, uh, North American religions and Hinduism, which we will be talking about tonight or this afternoon. Okay, let's begin to, to look at the, the religion of Hinduism, uh, if you will. The religion of Hinduism as a religion was never came into existence until the 19th century. Now, that's kind of hard. Uh, to believe that would be the 1800s, but as a religion itself, it never came into existence as Hinduism until the 1800s or the 19th century. Many people, uh, many of the people only ad identified it with communal living, okay? Uh, people, before they called it Hinduism, they considered it to be communal living, or you had your place in a caste, C-A-S-T-E, uh, which was not necessarily a part of a religion as such. Some Hindus reject the Vedas, the V-E-D-A-S, we'll talk about, about them in just a little while. And during that period of time, the, the, the priests became a big part of the organization and it was built around, their religion was built around a saint or a sage or someone like that before it actually became uh, a verifiable, a verifiable or uh, religion as such as we think about it. Others choose not to become a part of any of that, but they choose to go into solitude. A lot of the early people before Hinduism came into existence as such, they would simply go off and they would practice contemplation or they would practice some kind of uh, meditation, maybe yoga or something like that. Some during that period of time would say that there was the divine. There is the divine out there somewhere, but that divine is not identifiable. But when it finally came into existence as a religion, Hindus be began to believe there was a God, but this God was too expansive that it was beyond description. So therefore, they could not really give it, uh, this God, any kind of a description at all. Okay. And there is a great diversity in Hinduism. There is a great diversity in Hinduism, and there are some, but there are some core uh, concepts in which most uh, Hindus believe. And here they are: karma, K-A-R-M-A. -A. Most Hindus believe in karma. It is the law that determines one's the nature of one's incarnation. In other words, your karma here will justify or will determine, if you will, the nature of your incarnation. The second word is samsara, S-A-M-S-R-A. That is the cycle of, of death and birth and death and rebirth and continues on and on. Then there is a third word that they believe, moksha, M-O-K-S-H-A. That is the end of the cycle. They believe that people are on this endless cycle of life, death, rebirth, life, death, rebirth. Finally, moksha is the end of that cycle, the final release from the earth, the final release from all of our trials and all of our tribulations. Hindus do believe in a divine reality, but these views of a divine reality will vary from one place to another and from one person to another sometimes. Some believe in monism. Some Hindus believe in monism, and that is that, that reality is one. All of reality is one. Hindu, Hindus, some Hindus also have 
uh, dualistic beliefs. They know there's a divine reality such as God, but there are other gods, small g, uh, who are separate from, from the big God, uh, but they are part of reality. Okay? Let's talk about the names of the divine reality. Brahman, B-R-A-H-M-A-N, in monist, monistic Hinduism, this is the ultimate reality. This is the supreme reality. If you want to call him uh, the ultimate God, that's okay, because they may not, but we can. Then there's dualists, D-U-A-L-I-S-T-S. They use the term God with a little G, or perhaps the name of a certain deity. We'll talk about those deities in just a few minutes when we get it further into the lesson. There are others who believe in one divine reality, or God, or Brahman, or whatever name they give to him. They believe in that one divine reality, but they also believe in many gods. There's a divine reality out here, but there are many gods underneath that. Monistic Hinduism say that no, the gods and goddesses do not exist. Again, I want to reiterate, they believe in only one. And according to the Upanishads, which is an early uh, philosophical text of Hinduism, they say that there is only one. So they believe and they take seriously the Upanishads. In these teachings, the Upanishads, the sage says, the sage says, the divine powers, I want to say that again, the divine powers can be manifested in several deities at one time. I want you to hear this. At one time in Hinduism, there were probably 330 million gods and goddesses. But the sage who teaches from the Upanishads, they say that ultimately there is still Brahman, B-R-A-H-M-A-N. There's one supreme reality. When all things are stripped away, according to them, when all things are taken away, all you can see and touch is the ultimate reality, which is Brahman. To the, to the Hindus, even the dualists, all gods and goddesses are a part of Brahman. Kind of like in Christianity, the belief in one God, but three different parts of that God, okay? The Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. We'll talk about that when we get into Christianity. Many Hindus talk about God as a uh, an image. And to understand what God might look like, understand what Brahman might look like, Hindus rely on images. And not just Brahman, they rely on images uh, to talk about other gods and goddesses, the lesser gods and goddesses as well. And that's especially true for dualists. Again, I remind you, dualists might believe there is one ultimate god named Brahman, but there are other uh, gods and goddesses. And there are many different images used that can represent a god or a goddess. But at the same time, at the same time, people who believe that, they also believe that the images contain a divine presence of that God. In other words, that God in some way lives, or the goddess, they somehow live in that particular um, image. Hmm. Let's talk about the divine in nature. Now, if you are a nature person and you like to go out and get into the woods and different places like that, this, this might interest you a little bit. Hindus believe that Brahman is everywhere. Brahman is everywhere, so it's believed that Brahman is in the natural world. Everything you can see, everything you can touch is an expression of Brahman. So there's a lot of worship in Hinduism. There's a lot of worship of natural things like rivers and, and, and earth and mountains and the sun. And all of these worship ideas go all the way back to the roots of Hinduism. Many Hindus use rivers for special purposes. If you recall, people in, in India usually like to bathe, especially in the Ganges. And it's a, it's a sacred river to them, and it washes away one's sins. 
So if you want to wash away your sins in Hinduism, especially in days gone by, you would go down to the Ganges River and you would bathe. Some of the mountain peaks, some of the mountain peaks people took as a place to, to encounter Brahman and it would be a place of solitude. The, the Hindus also believe that some living things are most sacred, most well known is the cow. Now, why is the cow uh, considered to be so sacred? Most of the most early Hindus lived in rural areas. They lived on the farms, if you will. And when a child was weaned from his mother, they took up cow's milk. Therefore, the cows were considered to be a second mom. So the, the Hindu worships the cow more like out of respect for the animal. Now, Hindus have not translated their reverence for natural into true ecological activism. And that's very true because we know that the, the rivers that we're talking about are terribly, terribly polluted. But Hindus also believe that God comes down as avatars, A-V-A-T-A-R-S. And the two most well-known avatars were Krishna and Vish and Rama. Krishna and Rama. They were basically one God who came to earth as manifestations. And these two, uh, these two were manifestations of Vishnu, B-I-S-H-N-U, one of the greater gods. And then below this Vishnu, uh, there also came these other lesser gods. There's a word I'm going to give you, Bahag, B-A-H-A-G-A-V-D, Gita, new word, G-I-T-A. Bhagavad Gita, a sacred writing. It is a sacred writing that shows Krishna as a manifestation of the divine. Now, for a second, as we're generally talking, let's talk about the individual's quest for liberation. Every person in Hinduism wants to be liberated from where they are. The Atman, A-T-M-A-N, the Atman in, in, uh, in Hinduism is the soul, that part that lives inside. The underlying soul is not limited by the human body. It is that Atman that moves, it's that part of the, of the person that moves through the reincarnations. Monistic Hinduism, now that's just the belief in one, monistic Hinduism teaches that Atman, the soul, is truly Brahman. Now, the second word I want you to remember is karma, K-A-R-M-A, and we hear that word a lot. It means action. And it's really closely related to cause and effect, if you will. Good actions brings good effects. You've got good karma, so therefore you're going to live in a beautiful life, so to speak. For the future, for the future to look good, in a person's life, they, they must exhibit good karma, which leads to the next word, which is dharma, D-H-A-R-M-A. Dharma is law or duty or righteousness, living to uphold, if you will, the cosmic and the social order. Samsara, S-A-M-S-R-A, is that cycle of life, Death, rebirth, life, death, rebirth. What, what gives rise to samsara? Humans are drawn to the world in a real sense. In a real sense, we're selfish. So why would humans want to escape? Why would they want to escape samsara, that continued cycle of things? Because beyond all of this that we, we, the, the Hindus claim is, is life, there is this inexpressible end to live with brahman moksha m-o-k-s-h-a is the release from samsara moksha is the release from that cycle if you will and that release that release comes through good karma okay if you have good karma in your life then at the end of that particular life, you will be released from samsara 
It's overcoming attachments to the world and selfishness. And if we do that, then according to Hindus, it brings release from what we're living in. For monistic Hindus, moksha is when Atman, or that soul in the person, is reunited with Brahman. Now, how that happens is not really spelled out real well, but that's the way they believe. For dualistic Hindus, it is where Atman exists in the presence of the Supreme Being. In other words, uh, it's when our souls, the Atman, goes and lives in the presence of their Supreme Being, not becoming one with the Supreme Being, but being living forever in the presence of the Supreme Being, kind of like, again, uh, Judaism and Christianity and probably even uh, a, a little bit of the uh, uh, of the other uh, religions that we think about that uh, uh, involve that, like Islam. According to Hinduism, there are three paths of liberation. There is karma, marga, K-A-R-M-A, new word, M-A-R-G-A. It is to live right. It's to live right when it comes to relationships. Living right in relationships with other people around you, especially those who are close to you. The next one is bhakti, marga, B-H-A-K-T-I, New word, M-A-R-G-A. This is involved in worship. If you're worshiping in the temple or if you're worshiping in your home, and many, many people in Hinduism have little, uh, little altar-type places in their homes and they worship in their homes. And then there's finally Janna, J-N-A, excuse me, J-N-A-N-A, -A, new word, Marga, M-A-R-G-A. That is devoting one's time and energy to the purpose of contemplation and spiritual insights. Spending a lot of time in contemplation. How does Hinduism fit into, if you will, individuals in society? Liberation. Liberation or moksha, remember that, that being freed from life, may depend on the caste, C-A-S-T-E, your status, and for those of you who don't like uh, anti-feminism, it also might depend on gender. Castes, varna, C-A-S-T-E, new word, varna, is a hierarchical social structure, okay? There are four basic classes in the caste system. There are Brahman, B-R-A-H-M-I-N, which is different from the M-A-N. Brahman, who are priests, that's the highest order in this caste system. There are K-S-H-A-T-R-I-Y-A, that's the next in the caste system. They are the warriors, the ones who do battle. The next in the caste system are the Vaisha, V-A-I-S-H-Y-A. They are the producers. They are the farmers. They are the ones who, who might even be the sellers of, of the produce and things like that. Then there are the Shudra, S-H-U-R-D-A, the not necessarily the lowest in the caste system, but certainly down there, and they are the servants. So how does someone fall into the, these particular places in the caste system? Well, it's determined by birth. That's a great way to figure everything out. It's actually, uh, it's actually the truth. It's by birth. It's actually, um, you're in one class or the other by your birth. But there is one more class, okay? There's the Shudras, um, and the Shudras are the untouchable class or caste. Then, and inside of that, there is a subcast called Jati, G-A-T-I, and you can marry in your jati group, but you can never marry above and you can never go any below because there's nobody below that. According to Hinduism, let's get away from uh, the, the caste system. Let's talk about, according to Hinduism, there are four stages of life. And these are extremely important stages. The first is you're a student, you're learning, you're growing. 
you're, you're grasping as much as you can as far as knowledge is concerned. The second stage is the householder. It's where you become married, you have children, you're working, you're doing things. The third one is the forest dwelling hermit. Your kids are grown. Uh, everything is kind of mellowed out, if you will, and you, so you move off into the, into the forest and you dwell there as a hermit. And finally, the fourth stage is the renouncer, the renouncer, the one who says that nothing is real except Brahma, okay? Those are the four stages, the student, the householder, the forest-dwelling hermit, and finally the renouncer. According to Hinduism, there are four aims of life. Okay, four aims of life. Dharma, D-H-A-R-M-A. I mentioned it a while ago. That is your duty, the things you have to do. The second aim of life is Kama, K-A-M-A, which is sensual enjoyment. The third is Artha, A-R-T-H-A. That is gathering, if you will, material wealth. And finally, the fourth one is moksha. We've talked about that. It is liberation, completely separated from this world, finally leaving that, that uh, cycle of life and death and rebirth. There are sacred texts in Hinduism, the Vedas. The Vedas were not supposed to be uncreated by man, but they were heard, if you will, by the poet sages. They heard these the Vedas and they wrote them down. And according to Hinduism, there are four Vedas. The Rig Veda, R-I-G, new word, V-E-D-A, the Rig Veda, is a collection of hymns. The second Veda is the Sama Veda, S-A-M-A, -A, new word, Veda, V-E-D-A. Those are the melodies that go along with the hymns. The third uh, Veda is the Yajur Veda, Y-A-J-U-R, Veda, which is ritual formulas. And finally, the fourth one is the Artha, 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 Artha Veda. Let me spell that. A-T-H-A-R-V-A, -A Veda, V-E-D-A. Those are hymns and spells and incantations. A second sacred text are the Upanishads. These are the last of the Vedas. These texts bring in, if you will, the concepts that are basic to Hinduism. In the, in, in the, in the Upanishads, you will find the, the, the ideal of karma and samstra and reincarnation. A third uh, text would be the Bhagavad Gita, B-A-H-A-G-A-V-A-D, New word, Gita, G-I-T-A. This is the text that is used to bring new meaning to moksha and liberation. The Bhagavad Gita is, is back in the day when you could still go to the airport and, 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 and walk around anywhere you wanted to. A lot of Hindus would go to the airports and they would be trying to sell, if you will, the Bhagavad Gita to people. And they would buy it and, and earn a little money doing that. Now, there are sects, S-E-C-T-S, -E in Hinduism. Vaishnavism is the first one. Vaishnavism. V-A-I-S-H-N-A-V-I-S-M. These are Hindus who worship Vishnu. Makes sense. Vaishnavism. Then there's Shaivism, S-H-A-I-V-I-S-M. And these are the ones who worship Shaiva or Shiva, who is the destroyer at the end of times, but it is also the benefactor of the world to come. So there's Vaishnavism and Shaivism and the Shaktism, S-H-A-K-T-I-S-M, which is the worship of the great goddess Shakti, S-H-A-K-T-I. Gurus, saints, and sages. They also at times worship them because they are powerful religious uh, leaders and authorities who pass on their knowledge of what they know and they rank as the highest among the caste system, if you will. So, letting that kind of sink in, let's talk now, if you will, about the history of Hinduism. 
the Indus, I-N-D-U-S, Valley Civilization. It developed near the Indus River. It had this, this, the civilization, this civilization had developed great trade routes, if you will, with other countries. And so it became a very strong civilization. But this civilization fell for several different reasons. First, there was climate change, which caused uh, agriculture to kind of mess up. And then there were the migration of the Aryans, A-R-Y-A-N-S. So who were these Aryans, or Aryans, or however you want to pronounce it? They were nomadic. They were, uh, they were warlike. They loved fighting. And so they entered into the Indian subcontinent. And these people, these Aryans or the Ayans, the Aryans, they developed a body of text which are now known as the Vedas, the V-E-D-A-S. During the Vedic period, sacrifice became the big part of worship, sacrificing something. Fire became under the Vedas. Fire became the, uh, the, the focal point, if you will, of, of, of the sacrifice and the, and, the, and the worship. And after these nomadic people were kind of gone, there came the age of the Guptas, G-U-P-T-A-S. This was the Gupta Empire. These were the, these were the leaders who gave a lot of thought to the arts and the sciences and religion and literature. The Bhakti, B-H-A-K-T-I, was a period of time that came to challenge the rise, to challenge the Hinduism with the rise of two other religions close by, Buddhism and Jainism. Tantra, T-A-N-T-R-A, was another new system that, of, of, of Hinduism which replaced uh, a lot of the old stuff and there was more of an emphasis put on, on, on symbols and rituals and yoga postures and breathing techniques and mantras. Eventually, there was a clash of the Hindus and the Muslims. The Mughal, M-U-G-H-A-L dynasty, came into existence. There were, there were raids on India by Mah Mahmud Ganzi, M-A-H-M-U-D, new word, G-H-A-Z-N-I. He was, from, he was at, from Afghanistan, and he came in, and basically he took over most of northern India. <coughs> and so with it, with this invasion, also came the, uh, the ideal of Muslim religion and Muslim faith. Eventually, there was colonialism. The British came to India and they brought their language and they also brought their religious faiths. And this, this, this gave rise, because they came in and tried to convert everybody to their religion, this made the, the Hindus or some of the Hindus work very diligently to reform the Hindu faith and to revitalize it so that everybody didn't turn to the religions of, of England. Gandhi, we know that name, Gandhi, was became a person who struggled for independence from the British. He was a political, a religious, and social reformer, and he fought for, for Indian um, independence. But if you remember, he didn't fight physically. He really came up and he developed a political philosophy of nonviolent uh, resistance. And through that, he was able to topple the British Empire in India. Let's talk about Hinduism as a Hinduism as a way of life. Many believe it is not necessarily a, necessarily a religion, but more as a way of life. It places a great deal of emphasis on doing rather than believing, if you will. <coughs> the Hindus do have temples. And they do have icons. They have buildings of worship. And basically they contain two icons. One is the main icon, which is at the center of, of, the, of the building. But then there is another processional icon, 
which is carried around. And the, the, in, the, in the temple, this is really interesting, in the temple, there are at least 16 different offerings. Now, in the church today, in most Christian churches, we would really have a fit over 16 offerings. The eighth offering was the pouring of a substance on the icon. Now, let's talk about the forms of worship for a second. Arati, A-R-A-T-I, is the offering of light. In this particular part of the worship, lamps are lit with oil, and the lamps are waved, if you will, in front of the, the worship icon, but it usually went in a clockwise uh, motion or clockwise uh, direction. And while you were doing this, you were also doing mantras, which are, again, those recitations or those ritual formulas. Sacrifices, usually using fire, means that you built an altar, you lit a fire, and you made an offering. Milk, cereal, fruits, flowers, many different things like that. Not normally animal sacrifices, but the sacrifice of other things. In Hinduism, there is rites to passage or rites of passage. There is the initiation for ritual or rit initiation rituals for boys. It's a, it's a ritual that allows them to begin sacrifices. For girls, it begins at the time of menstruation. Also held as a ritual is marriage. Usually involves a fire sacrifice of blessing. And then there's death. Death is usually through cremation. It was a typical form of, of burial, and it is the last sacrifice. Usually when someone was, was cremated, uh, they were taken down to the Ganges, and they were, their ashes were spread in the river, which is supposed to be sacred within itself. Okay, that will end Hinduism. And again, just let me remind you that next week, uh, I will be sending you, uh, if you will, I'm going back to my, my place, Next week, uh, on November the 3rd, I will be sending you the exam on the introduction of North American religions and Hinduism. And then next week, we will study, if you will, Buddhism and Jainism, which are very closely related to Hinduism because they, they basically came out of the same particular area and grew out of those particular areas. So, again, I invite you to, to next week uh, go over your lectures from week before last and this week or tonight and then next week I will give you a written exam via the, t uh, via the email over uh, North American religions and Hinduism and the introduction that we talked about at the very beginning of last week's class. Y'all have a good week. I'll talk to you later.